let's go through the PowerPoint slides on uh, vision. So there are a lot of accessory organs of the eyes besides the actual eyeball itself. Um, there are the eyebrows which shades the eye from the sun and protects the eye from sweats or debris. Uh, if you think about a hot summer day, uh, you might be sweating from your forehead and as the sweat comes down and it hits the eyebrow, the eyebrow actually diverts it to the side uh, and so it doesn't go into your eye um, directly. Um, there are the eyelids that will uh, uh, keep the eye lubricated. Every time you blink your eye, you replenish it with a new uh, uh, a coat of uh, tears. And as we know, tears contains lysozyme, which would then keep the surface of the eyeball sterile. Um, there are eyelashes that can block the breeds from entering the eye. And there are these things called the sebaceous gland that will uh, 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 produce an oily secretion uh, that helps lubricate the eye. However, if one of these glands are uh, inflamed um, because uh, it's, it's blocked, for example, uh, then it could create uh, a swelling. Right? And something like this is called a sty. Uh, and if you ever had a sty before, um, it's going you will know it, it actually is is extremely extremely painful uh and um you know it doesn't go away until uh, at least a, a week or so uh later on uh it's rather uh, a nuisance so uh we talked about the anatomy of the eye already in the previous uh, uh video um, you can see there are three layers here the sclera the choroid and the innermost layer uh, called the retina so the sclera is the most superficial layer of the eye. It's the white of the eye. So when you look in, uh, uh, at someone's eyes and you see the white part, that's the sclera that you're looking at. Uh, uh, and it provides attachment sites for eye muscle uh, uh, so that you can move the eyeball up, down, left, right, sideways, rotate them. Right? There are a lot of muscles uh, that are connected to the eyes uh, and all of them are controlled by uh, your cranial nerves. Uh, remember, uh, uh, four pairs of cranial nerves are dedicated for eye movement uh, uh, out of the 12 pairs that you have. Uh, and at the front, the sclera is going to become the cornea, <coughs> which is the most anterior portion uh, of the sclera. And in order for light to pass through it, it would have to be uh, transparent. So uh, here is the uh, cornea, uh, and it's again convex in shape uh, to allow you to collect light from a wide angle. Uh, choroid uh, contains uh, blood vessels to nourish the eye uh, and at the front uh, it, it transitions into the iris which is the color part of the eye uh, and the color of your eye is uh, uh, going to be uh, determined by how much uh, melanin you have um, the pigment uh, the same pigment that determines uh, our skin color uh, our hair color and so on and so forth uh, and that is uh, genetically determined so um, if you have less melanin then you will have a lighter eye color like blue and green uh, and then if you're more melanin then you would have a darker uh, eye color and, and at the center of the iris uh, that's where you will have the opening the pupil um, and so the iris can contract or relax um, to decrease or uh, uh, increase the size of the pupil uh, but that's not something that we can control it's uh, completely under the control of the autonomic nervous system um, sometimes um, we go to the eye doctor uh, they might give you some eye drops to dilate your pupil so that they could take a better look at the um, at the uh, at the retina uh, and and uh, and you will notice afterwards you, you everything is so bright and you might not be able to focus um, when you when you read things uh, or you might not be able to drive um, because uh, uh, the there's just too much light entering uh, the eye. So, you know, they usually ask you to have someone um, to take you home uh, rather than driving uh, yourself. So changing in the pupil size uh, also allows focusing an object at, uh, at different uh, distance. So this is another picture that shows, uh, you know, the anatomy of the eye. Um, you probably should uh, take a look at this and compare it to the ones that we've labeled. Um, generally, the more diagrams you see, uh, the better you will be uh, at labeling them. When we were label the, labeling the eye uh, in the first video, we talked about how the lens needs to change shape uh, in order to maintain focus on something that's far away or nearby. Um, so if you want to look at something that's far away, the lens has to be uh, thinner, uh, whereas if you want to look at something that's nearby, uh, the lens has to be thicker. And in order to uh, change the thickness of the lens, um, you will have to uh, rely on the contraction or relaxation of the ciliary 
body or ciliary muscle, same thing, uh, uh, which would then in turn change the tightness in the suspensory ligament. Okay? So uh, let me try to explain this in, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a diagram for you. Um, so this is looking at your eyes from the front. Okay, um, This will be the lens, the lens and connecting uh, connected to the lens are going to be these uh, these ligaments. Okay, so these are the suspensory ligaments. Right? So that kind of radiates around from the from the lens, uh, and the other end of the lens is going to be is going to be the ciliary muscle, ciliary body. Same thing. Okay, so uh, the ciliary muscle is uh, going to be circular uh, in shape, and so uh, when you uh, contract the ciliary muscle the circle actually gets smaller and when you relax the ciliary muscle the circle gets bigger um, the best way to remember this is um, you know if, if you are trying to dry a, a towel a wet towel and, and you uh, uh, twist it and squeeze it you contract it it becomes smaller okay and then when it it's 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 open up when you relax the towel it, it gets bigger right so uh, when do you want to do what well, it turns out if you are looking at something that's nearby, okay, if you're reading a book or something, then you want the uh, muscle to contract. Okay, so by contracting, you are making a smaller circle. Okay, smaller circle. So this is the muscle, ciliary muscle, contracts. Okay, so it makes a smaller circle, and then what happens is because you're making a smaller circle then you are not pulling on the suspensory ligament as much and so they become loose okay so now there is not as much tension to it and then what happens is your lens will actually become uh, 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 thicker okay so if you look at the lens from the uh, from the side okay uh, it's going to be a little bit thicker thicker because you're not pulling on it from all sides okay so uh, what happens here is the suspensory ligaments, suspensory ligaments, they are going to be loose, okay? And as such, the lens, lens uh, becomes, becomes thicker. And that's what you need when you are looking at something that's nearby. Uh, on the other hand, if you're looking at something that's far away, far away, you would need the uh, ciliary muscle to relax okay and relaxing the ciliary muscle will make it bigger okay and of course all these are controlled auto automatically uh, by your brain um, you don't really have to think about these things uh, when you shift the focus uh, and this uh, in this case your ciliary muscle ciliary uh, muscle missing the word muscle here okay your ciliary muscle will relax it makes a bigger ring uh, and that will pull on the suspensory ligaments on all sides okay and so the ligaments the suspensory uh, ligaments will be will be tight now okay uh, and if you're pulling the lens on all sides then the lens will spread out a little bit more uh, and it will become uh, uh, thinner okay it will become thinner okay because now it's being pulled on all sides okay it's going to be thinner lens becomes thin okay so uh, as you are shifting your focus from nearby to far away or from far away to nearby uh, then you automatically will switch between a thicker lens and thinner lens uh, and uh, the ability to do this uh, is called visual accommodation visual accommodation um, the suspensory ligaments are kind of like a rubber bands and um, if you have a really really old rubber band then you will notice it starts to lose its elasticity uh, eventually uh, and that's the same for the suspensory ligaments as we get older and older um, the suspensory ligaments will not be as elastic as it used to be and we will lose the ability to uh, shift the focus to change the shape of the lens uh, 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 quickly uh, and that results in what we call presbyopia okay so that's when you uh, might need to have reading glasses okay that's because uh, let's say you are uh, just uh, uh, you know looking at something far away and all of a sudden you want to read 
uh, uh, something uh, on on your phone and you look down um, so your, your your lens is supposed to get thicker right um, but because the uh, suspensory ligament has loosed its um, elasticity over over the years uh, what happens is your uh, uh, lens is not able to change the thickness fast enough so you're looking down uh, but you cannot focus on what you're reading okay um, so you know wearing reading glasses will help fix that problem Okay, so visual accommodation, ability to change the thickness of the lens uh, as you shift the focus from far away um, to nearby or vice versa. And presbyopia is something that you will get when you are no longer able to do visual accommodation, usually because um, of aging. The lens divides the eye into the anterior and posterior compartment. Um, let's just quickly draw that for you. Um, this is like the eyeball. This is the cornea. There's your lens. So uh, between the lens, between the the lens and the cornea, that's where the uh, aqueous humor is going to be. Uh, that nourishes the cornea and the lens uh, because they don't have their own blood vessel supply. Uh, and afterwards, the aqueous humor will go to the back where it will become the virtuous humor um, that will help reinforce the shape of the eyeball. Uh, and we want to drain the excess virtuous humor through the scleral venous sinus. Uh, sometimes in the aqueous humor, you would have some uh, proteins uh, shedding from the uh, from the lens and uh, perhaps from the cornea, uh, and uh, these will create uh, things that kind of float around in our uh, field of view. Um, if you blink your eyes on a, against like a bright black background, like a computer monitor, or even looking at uh, the bright sky, and you notice things that are floating around in your vision, uh, those are floaters. Okay, so typically floaters are relatively harmless, uh, and if you have an excessive amount of floaters, um, then the doctor might give you some eye drops to uh, break some of them down uh, 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 so that it doesn't impede with your vision. If you don't drain the virtuous humor and they start to build up, then all that extra pressure in the eye will uh, be compressing on your optic nerve, uh, and that could uh, damage the optic nerve, resulting in uh, something called glycoma. Uh, in glycoma, you uh, start by losing uh, peripheral vision, uh, and eventually uh, you're going to go completely uh, blind. There are no treatments for glycoma uh, currently. Uh, most of the uh, uh, um, uh, treatment aims at uh, reducing the eye pressure, so you slow down the de degeneration of the uh, uh, of the optic nerve uh, and slow the uh, progression of the uh, of the disease. So the innermost layer is the retina, and uh, uh, in the retina there are two types of photoreceptors. We have the rod cells, uh, which is responsible for night vision and peripheral vision, uh, whereas the cone cells are responsible for detecting um, the different types of colors. Um, so we have cones for detecting red, blue, and green, uh, uh, and the combination of these uh, uh, receptors will help us register uh, a whole spectrum of, uh, of other colors. Um, and the uh, 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 at the back of the of the retina, there is a location called the fovea centralis. Um, you might remember labeling that uh, in the workbook uh, earlier. Uh, and in the fovea centralis, or just simply fovea, um, that's where you will find uh, uh, a lot of cone cells that are densely packed together. So we can only focus on a single uh, object at a time uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as human beings. I mean, some other animals uh, that have complex eyes, for example, uh, they might be able to have multiple foci, uh, focal points. Uh, but for us, we can only focus on one object at a time. So the things that you're focusing on uh, is going to get projected onto the fovea, uh, and that's where you're going to be able to produce a, a sharp image with, uh, with high definition. Uh, everything else that's not on the fovea is going to be part of your peripheral uh, vision, uh, and that's uh, going to be uh, uh, um, uh, registered by your rod cells. So. Um, as an example, if you're if you're looking at the videos right now, right, watching it on your computer or cell phone or whatnot, uh, and then someone is uh, standing uh, 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 beside you, then that person is going to be on your peripheral vision. So if that person were to uh, put their hand up uh, with some fingers, um, you 
within your peripheral vision, you will be able to tell that the person has just lifted their hand up, but you might not be able to see how many fingers they are holding up. Okay, uh, and and you know if you if you turn your head and now you look at the person's hand, you will be able to see clearly how many fingers they are they are holding up. But then the computer or your cell phone will now be part of your peripheral vision, so you will be aware that there are writings uh, on the screen, but but you won't be able to see exactly what what is written there. Okay, so we can only focus on a single thing at a time, and everything else is going to be uh, on the uh, peripheral uh, vision. So finally, all that information is going to be uh, carried by the optic nerve uh, uh, to your uh, to your brain, uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, where the optic nerve exits from the uh, from the um, from the eyeball. Um, you cannot have any photoreceptors on it, uh, and that creates uh, the optic disc or the blind spot. So as I mentioned, there are three types of cone cells, red, green, and blue. Uh, and by um, activating a combination of them, um, you will be able to see the, uh, all the colors uh, in the entire spectrum. So if you activate red and green, you'll be able to see yellow, uh, red and blue together gives you magenta, green and blue together gives you cyan. And if all three were to be activated together at maximum intensity, um, then you would get uh, the color white. So if you do uh, Photoshop editing or something like that, then you are probably familiar with this uh, with this concept. Uh, but let me demonstrate this um, uh, to you um, in this um, in this um, uh, in this circle. Okay. So right now the circle is white in color. Um, so what I can do is I can actually uh, 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 change the color uh, by uh, manipulating the combination of red, green, and blue. So right now it's red, uh, and if I go to uh, here and I say uh, more fill colors, for example, you can see uh, um, the red color is uh, is maximized. It's 255, okay? And then we turn off the green and the blue. So if I turn on green as well uh, to 255, then you will actually get the color uh, uh, yellow. Okay, so just like just like what what we said uh, here in the uh, in the other picture, right? Uh, in, in this slide, if you turn on red and green at the same time, if you stimulate the red and green receptors in your eye, uh, you are going to see the color uh, uh, yellow. So uh, we can try a few more um, combinations to, um, to see how this works. Uh, if I turn on uh, blue as well, so all three are activated, then you will actually get the color uh, white. If I turn off green, if I just turn on red and blue together, right? You can think about what color uh, we will get. And um, if I turn it off right now, you will see that we get the color uh, magenta, right? So uh, let's let's turn on green and uh, blue again, right? So uh, we we get yellow. But uh, how do you get something like uh, like orange? Well, if I click on the orange color here, you can see uh, 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 the orange is going to be it's kind of hard to get the orange actually but the orange is actually a combination of uh, of red and green and you know even if I turn on turn off the blue here there that's a, that's a, a better orange color um, so it's it's a lot of green a lot of red uh, and and a, and a little bit of, of green right so by turning on the receptors in different combinations you're going to be able to see the different colors okay so uh, how do you see a black well black is basically turning off everything so if you have zero 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 you can see it's black here what if we turn them on but not all the way so let's say uh, the maximum the maximum number is uh, 225, 255, right? So if we just turn it uh, at 100 for all of them, then you can see um, there's a little bit of grayish color, okay? Uh, and if I turn them to 50, 50, and 50, then, then it's even a darker color, okay? So by shifting these colors, uh, uh, you can see as I go to a lighter color all the way to white, white is maximum, where, where they are all 255, and as I reduce them, uh, then you will see the different uh, uh, grayscale. So keeping this in mind, let's uh, let's do an experiment. Okay, uh, let's do uh, go back to this uh, slide, and we're going to be staring at this picture. Okay, so you will be staring at this uh, uh, blue circle in the middle, 
Um, and, and now you, you, you can see that this picture uh, it doesn't really make sense. The colors are kind of off, right? You, uh, you see the magenta uh, uh, um, for, for the most part, and then there's some orange uh, and then some off brown in the sky. Uh, uh, and, and so you, you, you are registering these colors by stimulating the uh, uh, corresponding uh, receptors. To see the magenta, you will need the red receptors and the blue receptors. So they're working quite hard right now in the eyes uh, to um, to register that magenta color for you okay so now I'm gonna switch to the next picture uh, I guarantee you the next picture is uh, actually grayscale there are no color to it but if you blink you blink your eyes a couple of times right now um, you actually will add colors uh, to uh, to the grayscale picture okay you're probably seeing green here right now um, the reason you're seeing green here is um, remember this here and you know the color should be fading now uh, it doesn't uh, uh, stay on permanently okay your eyes is able to reset itself so if, if you're looking at this picture now with no color um, this gray color is um, going to require the red and the green and the blue uh, to be at say uh, 50 okay uh, at the number 50 50 50 okay but what happened was in the previous slide in order for you to see this magenta right your red green blue okay the green is not working uh, but the uh, uh, red and the blue may be working at 200 okay so when you switch to the next one where you need all three to be working the red and the blue are kind of tired from before so w when you need them to be at 50 they might actually be just functioning at like 10 because you tire them out in registering their magenta color and so on a gray uh, 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 a color like this you are going to be seeing seeing green okay uh, uh, so that could be explained for other parts of the picture as well uh, and that's how your brain kind of add colors to it it's not really your brain that's doing it. it's, it's more of like your photoreceptors uh, playing tricks uh, on you uh, and you're able to paint uh, uh, the grayscale pictures okay so this next concept is a little bit complicated so we're gonna explain it uh, in the uh, in the course pack here uh, so please find this diagram uh, and we will uh, color uh, we'll label this together and for this to work you're gonna need to have uh, two different colors um, so we are looking at the uh, eyeballs from the top uh, and this is your left eye left eye and this would be your right right eyeball and uh, we're gonna add a pupil to it here at the at the front pupil here so um, everything that's on your right uh, is going to be your uh, right FOV right FOV and everything that's on your left uh, is going to be your left uh, FOV field of view okay so let's we have a red person on the right FOV and then a blue person on the left FOV um, so uh, which part of the brain is responsible for uh, um, uh, perceiving information from each of the fields um, so let's take a look right light travel uh, straight so what that means is uh, anything that's on your left FOV will actually end up on the right half of uh, both eyeballs okay right half of both eyeballs and then what happens is um, the information from the left FOV will be uh, traveling through the optic nerves right? so there, there's gonna be the optic nerve on of the left eye carrying information from the left FOV and there is going to be optic nerve from the right eye also carrying information from the left FOV and then what happens is these two nerves uh, will come together at this uh, at this point uh, and this location is called the optic optic chiasma okay optic chiasma is where the optic nerve from each eye is going to cross over uh, and um, you might remember in uh, lecture six, uh, we we label the optic chiasma. Right? It's in front of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, the, uh, the junction of it. Right? Um, that's the optic chiasma. And so um, the two nerves uh, from each side, from the from the left optic nerve, optic nerve will converge, will come together with the right optic nerve. Okay, and they will uh, merge and continue to travel towards the right half of the brain. Okay, so that's going to go like this. Okay, um, after they come together, 
they will be traveling along the right optic track now because we're inside the brain okay uh, that will then go to the right uh, thalamus and then the information will get projected uh, to your right occipital lobe okay so uh, the left field of view will be processed exclusively by the right occipital lobe let's take a look at the right FOV now uh, and again because light travel in a straight line then uh, anything on your right FOV will be projected onto the left half of the eyeball okay, of both eyeballs right? and that information will be traveling through the optic nerve okay? and they will come together at the optic chiasma but because it is the right FOV this time then they will uh, merge and then continue onwards on the left side of the brain okay? so this would be the left optic track carrying it to the left thalamus and then uh, to the left occipital lobe all right so um, unlike other things in the body where the right half of the body is uh, controlled by the uh, left half of the brain um, the eyeballs are a little bit different okay uh, both eyeballs uh, information from both eyeballs will be processed by uh, both sides of the brain uh, however, the right field will be processed by the left uh, brain uh, exclusively, whereas the left fields are going to be um, processed by the right brain exclusively. Let's take a look at some of these questions and see if we can answer them. Um, the right optic nerve carries information from which field? So you can take a look at here. This is the right optic nerve, and you can see that it carries information from both the red and the blue field representing the right and the left FOV so the right optic nerve is going to be carrying uh, information from both FOV what about the left optic nerve same thing left optic nerve is here uh, and left optic nerve will be uh, receiving information from the left eye but the left eye can uh, receive uh, 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 light from both right and left uh, FOV so this is also both. What about the right optic track? The right optic track you can see only contains blue uh, uh, colors which means uh, the blue originates from the left FOV right so the optic track on the right side only uh, contains information from the left FOV. Uh, on the other hand the left optic track will be processing uh, or carrying rather carrying information from the right FOV okay uh, the right optic track carries information from which part of the eye so right optic track is here if you trace the fibers they actually trace back to the right half of both eyes right uh, half and the left optic track will be carrying information from the left half left half of both eyes okay so this might be a little bit confusing uh, but um, try to go through that uh, a couple times uh, watch it again if you need to uh, and hopefully it will make more sense uh, to you uh, over here this in the PowerPoint slides this is a more uh, a, a nicer diagram I guess uh, but it conveys the same uh, sort of information that I just described uh, to you let's take a look at some common uh, vision problem uh, so nearsightedness and farsightedness uh, and astigmatism uh, so let's explain it in this um, in this diagram here so we have the normal eyeball and then here is the lens uh, there's the cornea and the light rays are going to be coming in and focusing it on the fovea to allow you to see our sharp image okay so um, the lens here is like the projector uh, and the, uh, fo the fovea here is like the screen that you're projecting on so in uh, in nearsightedness, nearsightedness, uh, which means you can see uh, close but not far away. Okay, so another name for that is myopia, myopia. Right, so in myopia, um, you cannot see far away object uh, clearly. So what causes that? Uh, 
it's caused by your eyeballs becoming too long. Okay, so of course this is an exaggeration. No eyeball is ever going to be like this this long. Uh, it's going to be longer than the normal one. Um, but uh, but again, this is just an exaggeration. So I'm going to put the lens here for you uh, again, and I'm going to skip the cornea to keep it simple. Right, so what happens is um, the light ray comes in. Uh, light ray comes in here and your lens is going to bend it uh, but instead of focusing it on the fovea uh, because the eyeball is too long now you will be focusing in front of it so this is the equivalent of you know putting the screen a little bit farther away um, so the image will appear to be blurry okay so that that is the focal point instead of on the fovea so to fix this problem to fix this problem we are going to have to wear a diverging lens okay so this is called a diverging lens, diverging lens, uh, or or uh, it is also known as a, a concave, concave lens. Okay, so uh, a diverging lens uh, is going to split the light rays uh, before they are able to enter the eyeball. Okay, so uh, we're gonna have the parallel light rays coming in like before. But now the diverging lens will split them apart first, and so when it enters the um, the, the lens, uh, they will come together again. But this time, they will come together at the right place at the vovia. Okay, so it will be focused again. So how much do you need to spread the rays by, depending on how bad your vision is, right? So uh, if it's really bad, you might have to uh, split them uh, uh, more apart, uh, uh, and if it's you know not. Uh, very bad, um, just a little bit bad, then you don't have to split them uh, uh, as far apart. So that is for nearsightedness. Uh, on the other hand, the other problem you might have is uh, is farsightedness. Okay? So farsightedness is the opposite. Uh, you can see far away clearly, but you cannot see nearby objects. So this is called hyperopia. hyperopia. In hyperopia, your eyeball is uh, uh, shortened like this and again this is an exaggeration uh, and here is your lens so um, the light rays are going to be coming in light rays going to be coming in and they are going to be converging uh, but this time they are converging behind your retina okay uh, instead of on the fovea um, and so they are converging uh, too late rather than uh, uh, too soon uh, in the case of nearsightedness so um, the kind of lens that you need this time to fix the problem is a convex lens okay a, a converging lens converging or or convex uh, lens okay so a convex lens will split the light rays uh, uh, sorry will, uh, will will cause the light rays to come together uh, 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 a little bit first before before they enter your lens okay so when they enter your lens uh, they now will be able to come together uh, on the uh, fovea once again okay so diverging lens for myopia converging lens for hyperopia so you can actually tell if a person has a uh, farsightedness or nearsightedness by looking at what kind of uh, uh, glasses they're wearing uh, if they're wearing a glasses uh, and uh, that causes their face to kind of indent a little bit like that uh, then you know this is uh, a diverging lens and the person has a, a, a nearsightedness uh, whereas uh, if you see their face bulge out a little bit or their eyes appears to be bigger than normal uh, then you know they're wearing a converging lens because a converging lens is like a magnifying glass right it causes light rays to come together uh, and so this person is going to have far sightedness. And there is a third problem called astigmatism. In astigmatism, the lens uh, becomes uneven, uh, and so rather than having a single focal point on the uh, on the retina, uh, uh, the rays are not really focusing evenly, and so things uh, appears to be scattered. Uh, and it's going to be particularly um, severe uh, at night. Uh, uh, so this is what normal vision will look like, uh, and then for someone with astigmatism, um, then you will see the scattering of light uh, like this. Uh, and to to correct the problem, you would need to have a, a, a glasses, a lens that's going to uh, readjust the unevenness on your actual lens, uh, and so you'll be able to refocus the uh, uh, the light. Um, and that's it for the eyeball. Uh, in the next video, we are going to uh, be looking at the years.